Bros of Buff Chest Investments. This is Brosa speaking. Who am I going to make rich today? Ah, yes. Hi, Brosef. Yes, my name is Karen Worthington. A friend of mine gave me your number. She said you had some hot stock tips that were always bringing in big returns. And we can always use another vacation home, darling. Of course, Karen. What's an American without three vacation homes? Am I right? <laughs> You've come to the right place. I always have some guaranteed winners that are going to bring big returns, Karen. Big returns! Okay, great. What are they? I always have a few avenues that we can go down, you know what I mean? But if you want a whale stock, like, like a big fish that's going to bring in big returns, I always recommend investing in oil. There's a new pipeline project that's going through this Indian reservation that nobody cares about, and it's going to bring in massive returns, Karen. Massive! Ah, oh, yes. Well, I was reading about climate change or something the other day, and it's a little concerning. I mean, we have a place in the mountains, so we're not terribly worried about it. But I must tell you, I am voting for Joe Biden, and he says that we should do something about climate change. So... <laughs> Yeah, no problem at all, Karen. I get you. I feel you. You want to get in on that green capitalism, that green dollar. That's a good dollar. That's a really good dollar. Well, in that case, I would recommend clean-burning natural gas stocks. Really? Yes, yes. Hillary Clinton always talks about how much better for the environment fracking is, and I am a member of the Pantsuit Nation. Oh, I just love her. And I always support the empowerment of women, except for that lying harlot, Tara Reid. <gasps> women are always after powerful men's money. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! You're telling me. You should meet my lady. Yeah, but because I'm a straight shooter, like, and I'm being authentic, I have to advise you that the returns on fracking aren't quite as good as what they are for oil. Oh, really? Well, how much less? Uh, probably... Probably 20% or so, you know, like not a bad return, but I like to bring in great returns, big returns, Karen, massive! 20%? Brosef. Well, you just said it's going through a little Indian reservation anyway, right? It's not like they don't make plenty of money from their casinos. And I won't be grandiose, Brosef. It's not like my little investment will make a difference in climate change anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hold up a second. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. Am I right? Am I right? I mean, we talk about making money or starting a charity. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're right, Brosef. I can always just donate some of the profits to starving kids in Africa. They don't have it as good as Americans, you know. You are so right, Mr. Buffchest. Let's do it. Haha, <laughs> you won't be sorry, Karen. We'll talk again after I've made you a little more rich. Ha! 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 Peace, love, and profits, Karen. Okay, okay, okay. Bye bye. Archie, darling, book an extra week in the Hamptons, would you? And get Rosalita to bring me another glass of Chardonnay. Another win for Brosif. Gotta get psyched for the next call. Mm -hmm. Oh, news alert. Always good news for Brosif. Losses in the final hour of trading stocks closing near session lows as oil settles below zero for the first time ever. Unbelievable. Hey Tribe, and welcome back to Free Radicals. My name is Tori. And I'm Jeremy. And in this video, we want to try to answer the question as to why so many of us have so many self-destructive impulses living in our society. Living under capitalism has a very dramatic effect on all of our psyches, whether we realize it or not. Of course, America is not the only capitalist country in the world but it is by far the most Wild West version of capitalism on planet Earth. And as such, all of the problems that are caused by capitalism are amplified in the American psyche. In other countries, taking care of their citizens was a foregone conclusion. It was not even something they considered. 
they just put it into effect. Mortgages and rent freezes were put into effect immediately. Paychecks were either completely covered between the company and the government or partially covered at least. Here, any talk of doing anything like that is still treated as socialism, even though they have shut down the economy and there's no way for people to make money. The effects of living under a society where you really never feel like you're being taken care of, even though you are a tax-paying citizen and you contribute to society, this type of abandonment by our own government is detrimental for mental health. Everyone knows how abysmal mental health is in the United States of America. We have some of the highest rates of suicide in the developed world. Our mass shooting epidemic is very unique to the United States. We write more prescriptions for antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications than any other country on earth. All of these detrimental factors paint a very bleak picture for the state of the American psyche. This video is going to be an emotional roller coaster for us and possibly many of you, but we ask you to stick with us until the end because this is a conversation that our society desperately needs to have. In this video, we will try to make the case that the reason that we are all so self-destructive is because of the system that we live under. If we do not confront our own demons within, then we will continue to perpetuate the ugliest and most destructive aspects of our society. Everyone has self-destructive impulses, including us. Before we get into the substance of this video, we want to make it inescapably clear that nothing we are going to talk about in this video is meant to come across as judgmental or condescending or us thinking that we're superior to anyone. We honestly do not feel that way whatsoever. But the goal of this video and our channel in general is to help more of us realize that the feeling of being judged is a product of social engineering designed to prevent us from looking at ourselves and our society objectively. We have been socially conditioned to be so reactionary to criticism, no matter how good the intentions behind it may be, that most of us default to a defensive projection that the only reason anyone would ever talk about any of our problems is so that they can feel superior to us. This is a learned behavior that is a product of living under capitalism in a hyper-individualistic society where we are constantly comparing ourselves to others. It is not human nature to be this way. Our goal with this video is to be able to have an open, beneficial dialogue about the fact that all of us are damaged. We all have issues to overcome. And if we are to change ourselves and society, we have to evolve to a more mature, non-reactionary state of mind where we can honestly acknowledge our own issues while also having compassion and acceptance for the issues of others. Rosa Buffchest and Karen Worthington are parodies of some of the psychological damage that living under a capitalist system can cause. I hope you guys had as much fun watching that as what we did filming it because it was the most that we'd laughed in weeks. <laughs> These characters are meant to portray what can happen to us if we're not conscious of the effects of the system on our mental health. They're also meant to give our audience a break to hopefully laugh <laughs> while taking in such very heavy and emotional subject matter. Now we will begin exploring some of the self-destructive behaviors and vices that are caused by this system. We cannot overemphasize that none of the habits that we will be discussing just happen because someone is a bad person. That is not how human beings work. We are sensitive creatures who are extremely susceptible to the effects of our environment. Keep in mind, none of the ideas that we are going to be discussing are completely original and come from ourselves. We will be leaning, very much so, on the work of absolutely brilliant psychologists that came before us. We strongly recommend the book, When Past is Present, by Dr. David Rico. It is invaluable for understanding where some of our impulses and behaviors that rule our lives come from. Let's begin by examining some of the most commonly observed behaviors that people are exhibiting since the COVID crisis became our new normal. Clearly this crisis is not where our destructive behaviors began, but they've certainly been intensified since we've been living in this more turbulent environment. Since this crisis began, I'm sure we've all seen the social media posts of people talking about how much they've been drinking, or fighting with their spouse or their children, or how much weight they've gained, 
But the most disturbing behaviors, in my opinion, that we've been seeing is the narcissism of means testing each other and ourselves over who deserves what, over who deserves government aid and who doesn't, or who is an essential worker and who isn't. On one side, we're seeing protests from the working class who want better conditions at the workplace, and they are being met with counter-protesters of people who just want to get the economy back on track at all costs. We are the only country who is protesting lockdown orders. Because for the first time in our extremely privileged existence, we are being inconvenienced to the point where we can't go out and chase shallow short-term pleasures as soon as the thought comes into our head. I am not referring to people who are in truly extremely desperate situations where they must get back to work, otherwise they will not be able to feed their children or pay their rent. When we are referring to narcissistic behaviors during the COVID crisis, we are talking about the people who do have the money to weather the storm or the luxury to work from home and not with the public who are trying to push the most vulnerable, most desperate people of our society out into the workforce before safety measures are negotiated. We are referring to the people who view quarantine orders as some sort of infringement on their God-given right to satisfy any impulse they have immediately. Look, I'm only a couple of months behind. Sir, you have a huge home loan. We don't have any relief programs for homes of this size. Don't you have any assets you can sell or something to hold you over for the time being? Uh, yeah, everything I have is tied up in the market. We were expecting huge returns next quarter. I would have been a fool not to go all in. You don't understand. I gotta play to win, baby. Uh-huh, yes, sir. This stupid coronavirus is not my fault. We're shutting down the economy so some old and sick people that were going to die anyway can live a little bit longer. It doesn't make sense, man. People die. They're taking away everything I ever worked for. This is un-American. They're taking our rights. They're taking our freedom. Uh -huh. Look, sir, I just work here. I make $12 an hour and my grandmama is in the hospital right now with COVID. Is there anything else I could do to help you today? No, I guess not. Because you're a part of the problem. Why don't you just quit your job and collect unemployment? You'll make more money that way anyway. Lazy cuck! Tired of this shit, man. Tired of this. Not fair. Shouldn't happen to winners. Hello? Stacy. It's Broseph. Chad, I already told you, don't call yourself Broseph when you're talking to me. That's your brand name. You have to be more authentic if you really want to connect with people. Anyway, I'm working. What do you want? Working. Yeah, yeah, whatever, sugar tits. Listen, daddy's in a bind. It's only temporary, but I need to borrow some cash. What do you mean, you need money? They want to take the house. They don't realize that the market is just panicking and people are just selling everything off in a panic because they're scared. They shouldn't be scared. What's everybody so freaking scared of? Bunch of losers! Anyway, it's all going to bounce back. I just need some help to stay on my feet j just to weather the storm for a little while. You know, you know how it goes. So you're broke. No, no. Not broke. That's cute, but sounds to me like you're broke. Come on, Stacy. I know that you make 20000 a month just for being hot. And you only spend my money. God, Chad, I don't have the energy to think about this right now. I have been fasting for four days because the girls and I are going to the beach tomorrow to have a photo shoot. I have to look my best and you're going to give me stress wrinkles. I bought that cute little nose of yours. So your money is my money, and it's time for you to pay up. Listen, babe, I've been meaning to talk to you anyway. I met this super hot guy last weekend at a social, and he's like a super rich magazine editor. He says he's going to put me on the cover of Cosmo. We had a really great night. And you know my followers love seeing me do new and exciting things, so 
I think I've just outgrown you. Sorry, babe, but I wish you all the best and I hope you find your bliss. Toodles. Would you at least have any blow, Stacy? She hung up on me. Do things for everybody, man. Nobody's there for me. I'll show her. We are having real discussions that border on eugenics over what is an acceptable number of people to die so that capitalists can go back to making money and to avoid any implementation of a universal basic income or any sort of social program that would bail out working people during this crisis. Make no mistake, that is what this is about. It is about making sure that people do not understand that socialist programs can work. It is so sad to see that most Americans cannot even envision an alternative to getting their needs met beyond going back to work before it is safe or before new safety measures that will decrease profits are implemented. The idea of the government giving us our tax money back that we paid in, that we earned from the profits of our labor is somehow framed as wanting a handout or being lazy, even though we don't have the ability to work. The idea of giving assistance to needy people is always framed as leading to totalitarianism in America. This makes no sense. It has been constantly drilled into our heads for centuries that somehow sharing all the resources of planet Earth equally with all people will always lead to tyranny. But it is not tyranny for a small handful of ultra wealthy oligarchs to steal all of the wealth of the planet. We're about to have our world's first trillionaire in Jeff Bezos. That's not tyranny though. That isn't tyranny. It's only tyranny if we make sure that people aren't starving to death. The insane anti-government propaganda that began after the New Deal has fully reached its zenith with this crisis. If we do not unite and come together now under a humanitarian cause, then we will end up with a surveillance state, a police state, a theocratic dictatorship run by fascists, and they will blame it on us. They will blame it on you. They will blame it on those of us who saw the need for lockdown orders to protect public health and the most vulnerable members of our society. They will blame it on anyone who believes in science and reason and anyone who has compassion for our fellow citizens. They will call us sheep and say that we worship our government overlords when in reality, it is they who worship capitalism and who worship the capitalist oligarchs who are using and exploiting us in our most desperate hour. So how did we end up this way? How did we end up with these ideas? Let's talk about authoritarian parenting and authoritarian religion. Many survivors of the most extreme forms of child abuse grow up to idolize their abusers. By forcing children to live in environments of absolute authority, it damages their fragile minds to the point where they just accept their horrific conditions as just the way it's supposed to be. They internalize this abuse and feel as though they deserve it. America is the most religious country of all developed nations and it is so obvious in the behaviors that are to be found in our people. To be clear, we are not condemning all forms of spiritual belief. If you believe that there is a creator involved in the universe being brought into existence, but you don't feel any religious dogma, like people have to obey what you want them to believe, we don't see a problem with that. There is no harm. There is no victim. We are only condemning religious fundamentalism that has detrimental effects on people's mental health. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a what? A wretch like me. You're a wretch, you're worthless, you are born dirty and evil, and you don't deserve anything but an eternity in hell, unless you relinquish your free will and autonomy and agree to worship an invisible sky daddy who looks down on you and shakes his head disapprovingly while you are masturbating. 
This archaic belief system, with thousands of years of tyranny and bloodshed, has been used to manipulate people into submission since civilization began. Our innate fear of death is weaponized against us, so that we spend our entire lives in servitude and constantly reaffirm to ourselves that we are entitled to nothing. Our innate desire for fellowship and community is also weaponized against us, as faith-based communities will cast you out and ostracize you if you question their dogma. Especially now that humans have been so cut off from each other, by technology and consumerism and hyper-individualism, the fear of losing our peer group has never been stronger. Religion is very manipulative in how they acquire new followers. If you've ever been to church, you've heard the testimonies from people about how they got saved from their own self-destructive impulses. The stories are always the same. I couldn't stop drinking or doing drugs or having sex with everything that moves or gambling or stealing or whatever. But then I came to church and God saved me. In reality, these people were hitting rock bottom and religion was there to capture them in their weakest moment. Community is soothing and it's a requirement for happiness. And the church offers community when everyone else in our lives has turned their back on us or shunned us. Religion will provide acceptance, comfort, and understanding that people may not be able to get from themselves or anyone else in their lives. But the love from the church and God are both conditional. If you question anything you are told, which in modern America includes acceptance and praise of all things capitalism, then this conditional love will be taken away and likely whatever self-destructive behaviors or impulses that we had coming in will be further amplified by the loss of community. This is what we are up against when we try to get through to religious people. They are not stupid or gullible or ignorant. They live with a deathly fear that they will lose their sense of community or acceptance that they may have just found for the first time in their lives. For this reason, religion and capitalism are a marriage made in hell. So you see, I just wanted to be a writer but dad always told me, if you don't make a lot of money, you're a failure. Do whatever you have to do to get ahead. The world is a shark tank and you don't want to be a minnow. I feel like I've been living his life instead of mine. Well, it sounds like your daddy was a very smart man. You know, making money is important in the eyes of the Lord. Really? I don't remember much about the Bible, but I seem to remember the story about the only time Jesus ever really got angry was when merchants were trying to make money off the church. Didn't he say like the money changers were turning the church into a den of thieves or something like that? Oh, no, no, Brother Broseph. That was a misinterpretation. You see, Jesus was really so upset about having to pay higher taxes. He revolted against the tyranny of big government, and that's why churches are still tax-free today. Well, I guess I'll take your word for it. Anyway, I made all the money, I got the hot girlfriend, I partied and I had a great time, and I got the huge house, which they're coming to take in a couple days. But I never felt happy. I always felt like something was missing. I guess that's why I reached out to you, Pastor Pamey. Yes, these social distance virtual counseling sessions have been very helpful to our congregation during this crisis. Improfitable. Speaking of which, your time is about up, Brother Broseph. You will need to authorize another $50 for the next five minutes if you do want to continue receiving the Lord's help. $50 for five minutes? I thought that was for the whole session. I'm out of money, man, and you haven't given me any answers. Doing God's work costs money, my child. I'm sure you understand. God always needs more money. You're not some dirty socialist, are you? Hey, babe, how much longer are you gonna be? You told me to bring six of my friends and we're getting impatient. Wait a second. I know that voice. Stacy? What's taking so long? Oh, hey, Chad. Is that you? 
Are you finding your bliss yet? Oh, you two children of God know each other. How special. This is the guy who's getting you into Cosmo? Okay, now go wait for me outside, sugar tits. That is working. Okay. Are you kidding me? He's like the ugliest dude I've ever seen. Well, you are out of money, and we are out of time, Brother Broseph. But God be with you now. Come and sugar tits. What? Bunch of losers! Authoritarian parenting doesn't need to be religious at all. The desire to have domineering control over our children is often born out of the feeling that other people and institutions have domineering control over us. It is born out of feeling that our lives are spent in servitude, whether to our own parents, our employers, our governments, our religion. But if there is one thing that we can control, it is our own damn kids. This parenting style comes from a feeling of subordination, which is tragic for mental health. In the minds of many parents, perhaps subconsciously, they feel, well, I have been controlled and punished my whole life and you're gonna know how that feels. That's just the way things are. Get used to it. Do as I say, not as I do, etc. You know the lines. But many parents treat their kids in this controlling manner subconsciously because deep down, we want people to feel our pain because it justifies our own suffering. And it's not just parents that do this. We all do this on some level. We do it to everyone. We project our pain onto others as a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy to prove to ourselves that we are just as worthless as our authoritarian parents, our authoritarian society, or the imaginary sky daddy told us that we were. Especially in America, we are told that we are worthless unless we obey in every facet of our lives. We must obey our teachers, our parents, our peers, and our leaders. If we do not listen and obey, we get in trouble. And this feeling of worthlessness, this lack of acceptance, manifests in many self-destructive behaviors that we will get into now. Most of us are very uncomfortable with the idea that we engage in self-destructive behaviors and bad habits because of past trauma in our lives. But we feel understanding our trauma and where it comes from can be empowering. And running away from the causes of our problems can take us to a very unfulfilling place indeed. Many of us are adamant that we just enjoy whatever it is that we are hurting ourselves with. But the exploration into the deeper meaning that is driving our behaviors while uncomfortable and perhaps even frightening is vital in getting to the root of why we do what we do. And attaining that understanding is the only way that we will be able to make positive changes in our own lives and through those ultimately change society for the better. Let's talk about drugs. <laughs> First of all, we would like to say that we are drug positive. You are not about to get any just say no after school specials from us. <laughs> In fact, we are for the legalization and regulation of all drugs, all drugs. We respect the therapeutic and recreational use of all drugs. Many people use and abuse drugs for a variety of reasons. Many times we are simply trying to avoid dealing with a very difficult experience. People should not be put in jail where they will be subjected to even more extreme forms of trauma simply because they are sad. Drug addicts are sad people, not criminals. Not all drugs are the same and we like to break them into two categories being conscious drugs and avoidance drugs. Conscious drugs is a very big category and it will require more in-depth conversation in a later video. But for the purpose of this video, we're just gonna focus on avoidance drugs. For now, all we will say about conscious drugs, such as cannabis or psychedelics, is that they can be abused and used for avoidance. The king of all avoidance drugs is alcohol. 
So much so that it's not really looked at as any sort of a bad thing by society, even though it is a class 1 carcinogen. It causes numerous health problems and it's implicated in many cancers. It is glamorized and normalized so much so that you can barely make it through an episode of any TV show or a movie without seeing the characters either engaging in casual drinking or extreme forms of drinking. Alcohol does not help us coherently address our problems. It helps us avoid confronting them. For so many people, life is a cycle of going to a job that they absolutely hate and then coming home and drinking to forget about that job until they pass out. Alcoholics almost always have unresolved trauma. Let's be real. No one drinks to excess every single day because they're happy. Those of us who engage in excessive self-destructive habits due to feelings of worthlessness make very good consumers. We are always trying to purchase a product that will fill the void in our life. People also tend to make very bad decisions while under the influence of drugs and alcohol. The more we engage in avoidance drugs and do things that make us ashamed of ourselves, the more likely we are to engage in other self-destructive behaviors to avoid the shame that we just caused. The loved ones of alcoholics can often be damaged worse than the alcoholics themselves as they will constantly wonder whether that person is drinking because of them. Children who are introduced to alcohol at a very young age, often by adults that they trust, are more susceptible to alcoholism as well as a lifetime of depression. Smoking cigarettes used to be as normalized and glorified as using alcohol, but that has changed in recent decades. Now vaping is being pushed as a safer alternative to maintaining your cigarette habit. The commercials are obviously aimed at young people, as you will see flashy colors and special effects, electronic music, clearly aimed at a younger audience, although of course at the same time you'll see up in the corner, not for young people. Capitalism sees no moral quandary with advertising directly to children so that they can create more addicts to buy their products. Whether it's vaping or smoking nicotine, most users understand the harmful effects and perhaps even feel the negative health consequences every single day. But ultimately, this is just another cycle of avoidance and self-destruction operating at a subconscious level. Just like alcohol abuse, it is a way to relieve anxiety and tension that people get caught up in as a normal part of their lives. Perhaps most disturbingly, if you've ever been to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, almost everyone there chain smoke cigarettes. Clearly, they have not conquered the driving force behind addiction, which is trauma. This leads us to the issue of prescribed pharmaceutical drug dependency. The multinational pharmaceutical corporations of America are some of the most powerful companies on earth. They give more lobbying money to politicians than fossil fuel companies, defense contractors, or banks. And the result of this bribery is devastating as almost half of the American population takes at least one pharmaceutical prescription drug. And the majority of that group are taking a cocktail of multiple prescription drugs on a daily basis. Only the United States and New Zealand allow drug companies to advertise on TV, and we have the increased rates of prescription drugs to prove it. So if America is the greatest country on earth, why do our prescriptions for anti-anxiety and antidepressants dwarf the number in all other countries? Why do people feel like they need to take all of these drugs if life is so great here? Is this the sort of American exceptionalism we're aiming for? We don't need to describe the severity of our opioid epidemic here. People around the globe are appalled at the rates with which Americans abuse prescription opioids. Our heartless criminal justice system, which only understands punishment, will spontaneously change laws that makes it impossible for people who are addicted to access their normal prescriptions. At the same time, they make no social programs available to help them transition from their addiction. Dr. Carl Hart explains that pharmaceutical opioids are a chemical cousin of street heroin with very similar effects. Just as extremely expensive Adderall is a wealthy person's version of crystal meth. Although that does not stop parents from hooking their children on it so that they can get better grades. 
When addicts cannot legally fill their prescriptions anymore, it turns decent, hardworking people into criminals, as they must now seek out the black market to feed their addiction that their unethical doctors legally saddled them with. This all circles back around to us supporting the legalization and regulation of all drugs. No one should go to jail for addiction, especially in situations like this where a person may have done nothing wrong and broke no laws, but they ended up getting addicted to a substance that their doctors gave them. No one should have to risk overdosing and dying from black market heroin laced with fentanyl. Other countries have social programs for suffering addicts such as safe injection sites and therapy to anyone who may be suffering. We don't have that in America, even though we have the most addicts, because treating people like criminals is more profitable. Capitalist oligarchs can lock people up in for-profit prisons and use them for slave labor to produce the products that we all use on a daily basis. They do not have to pay prisoners a living wage, or any wage in most states. Private prisons are the new plantations. People who are hopelessly addicted to hard drugs such as heroin or crystal meth are trying to escape extreme forms of pain. Anyone who has ever read a book or watched a documentary about the experience of drug addicts has likely heard a drug addict describe their first hit of whatever substance they're addicted to as feeling like a warm hug. Almost without exception, the hardest addicts have the most difficult and excruciating pain that they are dealing with. Dr. Gabor Mate has written many books on the true causes of addiction and has written that while he was working as a doctor in Vancouver, every female heroin addict that he treated was the survivor of sexual abuse. Every single one. It is unjustifiable and morally repugnant to treat these people as criminals. Introducing the idea of taking care of addicts and treating them like the victims that they are brings a lot of resentment from a lot of people. They're angry that you would treat an addict as anything else than someone who deserves to be punished. And this is because of their own pain, probably caused by an addict in their life. Or they're just authoritarians that get off on punishing people. Living in such a profoundly evil society that treats sad and broken people in such a horrific way is enough on its own to turn someone into an addict. We strongly recommend any book by Dr. Gabor Mate, Dr. Carl Hart, or Johan Hari on the true nature of addiction and who drug addicts truly are. I was drinking that! I don't want your charity! I don't need help from nobody! I'm gross of buff chest! I'm self-made! Bunch of SJW pussies! Losers! Be back on top in no time. Proud to be an American at least I know I'm free and will forget it. Many of the people watching at this point may be thinking, I don't have any of those problems, but I sure feel sorry for the people who do. Well, that is likely not true at all because we are all addicts of something in this society, whether it's to drugs, or control, or food. The most widespread self-destructive habit that the majority of Americans have is eating unhealthy food in copious amounts as a means to comfort ourselves. We are bombarded with predatory advertising of chemically processed, hyper-addictive frankenfood before we are even able to speak. Just as we discuss drug advertisements on television, food advertisements are just as manipulative and dangerous. The young, impressionable minds of a toddler is no match for the clever and conniving minds of the advertising industry. Advertisements for junk food, once again directed at children, always depict eating junk food as going on some magical adventure, or having a lot of fun, 
or being the cool kid. Many studies have shown that children who are subjected to junk food advertising are far more likely to throw temper tantrums when they are refused it by their parents. These manipulations are already a part of us before we even have the ability to reason. So if you grow up addicted to junk food, do not blame yourself. There are extremely brilliant food scientists who have manipulated that food to make it as addicting as possible. There are also extremely brilliant, although very corrupted, psychologists who have worked with the advertising industry to figure out exactly how to get into your head and to make you associate eating that poison with feeling good. And it's not just clever advertising that instills the desires for these food. Emotional trauma makes us crave certain foods in a way that advertisers could only dream of. Imagine that you're a seven-year-old child and your mom always makes mac and cheese for you. And then one day she dies tragically. When you're 40 years old and you're still eating mac and cheese compulsively, you're not just doing it because it tastes good. In this scenario, mac and cheese is not just a food, it's a way to be close to your mom again. These things are operating at the subconscious level most of the time. So if you do eat a lot of bad food and you don't realize any of these connections, it's not unusual but they are there and they are affecting you nonetheless. Even in situations that are not quite as extreme or traumatic as that one, eating foods that we ate from our childhood can take us back to a time where life was just more simple. We didn't have so many problems. We didn't live in a world that we know to be dark and scary and unforgiving. It takes us back to that carefree time where we were not ultimately responsible for the direction of our own lives. If we find ourselves in difficult times in our lives, such as the loss of a job or the loss of a relationship, or just in the normal grind of the endless cycle of suck that seems to be our lives, eating these foods takes us back to when it was all so simple and we had none of the worries that we have right now, if only for a few minutes. Parents who still have these unresolved emotional eating patterns may very well pass these on to their children, and thus the cycle continues yet again. Our emotions and the baggage that we carry concerning food can be endless. We know how sensitive this subject can be, so content warning, we are about to discuss eating disorders. Dysfunctional behaviors surrounding food is not just limited to binging on junk food you can absolutely overeat healthy food. This is emotional eating. A lot of people will assume that they're just eating compulsively out of boredom, but if you dig a little deeper, it's more likely eating because of loneliness or discomfort from being alone. Many people do not eat much at all, and this is almost always tied to trauma surrounding our physical appearance being tied to our self-worth. Human beings are very sensitive Someone can be made fun of in middle school for being overweight or being too skinny, and that feeling will remain in our subconscious, driving eating disorder behavior well into adulthood if that problem is left unaddressed. The harmful effects of sexual abuse on a person's self-esteem or self-worth cannot be understated. Many survivors of sexual abuse develop shame around their eating habits and turn to closeted eating behaviors. In the predatory era of late-stage capitalism, there are many Instagram models, YouTubers, and influencers who have sought to capitalize on their eating disorder stories. Talking about our eating disorders is always encouraged, but many of them claim that they have conquered their eating disorders only to turn around and give health advice to all of their viewers that look very similar to an eating disorder. What I mean by this is you can't simply rebrand anorexia and call it fasting. Let me clarify, intermittent fasting can be very healthy and beneficial and it still involves eating a healthy amount of calories every day if you're doing it properly. But prolonged fasting on a consistent basis for any other reason than being prescribed by a healthcare professional to do so is not healthy or advisable. This is still extreme and self-punishing behavior, very likely being driven by unresolved trauma. 
Jumping from fad diet to fad diet is just another form of self-harm being caused by insecurity surrounding our appearance. And this problem of jumping from fad diet to fad diet is something that almost all of us, men and women alike, have in common because we live in such a consumerist, superficial society where there's so much emphasis placed on how we look rather than who we are as people. Please be careful who you take nutrition advice from. Two million people per year die of nutrition-related diseases in America. Life expectancy is going down. This is an emergency, but yet it's still treated as a joke. We are normally so uncomfortable with discussing our eating behaviors that often we just laugh it off or chalk it up to, well, that's just the way I am. This mentality is the product of a system that prioritizes profit at any human cost. Not only do capitalists make profit from when you buy the junk food in the first place, but they also make profit on the increased healthcare spending that you will need as a result of eating that junk food. Any proposals to decrease portion size or to stop advertising to children or to put any sort of health warnings on any of these very unhealthy foods will always be treated by calls of totalitarianism and of course the government wants to control every aspect of your lives. It's amazing. Anytime the idea of the government doing something good is proposed, it's always totalitarianism. Are you seeing this theme yet? If every American were to start eating a healthy diet that is suitable for human beings, our healthcare system as it exists today would crumble. It is a system of treating the chronic disease caused by unconscious, unhealthy lifestyles. Our rates of type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, and obesity should make this inescapably clear to anyone who doubts this. People are dying in their 30s of heart attacks. Fatty streaks have been found in the arteries of post-mortem children. We have become so disconnected from our food that our bodies need to nourish us in the sense that we don't know how to grow it, we don't know how to cook it, and we have no concept of what is truly nutritious or what our bodies need to thrive. So what do all these addictive, self-destructive habits have in common? Well, living under capitalism. This exceptionally cruel, exceptionally heartless 21st century version of capitalism. Capitalism specializes in creating addicts. It requires addicts to survive and to grow. Advertising to children and teenagers before their brains have a chance to fully develop is not an unintended consequence of capitalism. It is a core principle of capitalism. We live in a dehumanizing system where everything is a commodity, including humans, where nothing has value except for the potential profit that can be extracted from it. In this system, we are even encouraged to commodify ourselves, to turn ourselves into a brand. So many of our interactions have become transactional or an opportunity to market ourselves. Right now, we can see the detrimental effects of allowing this mentality to infiltrate our psyche as we are actively trying to quantify how many lives are worth sacrificing by getting them back to work during a raging pandemic just to let capitalism survive. Our character, Stacy, is our portrayal of what it looks like when we allow capitalism and marketing ourselves to be more important than developing real-life relationships. American life has no meaning. That is what is driving our need to self-destruct. That is what is fueling our pain. Human relationships and close connections with others are what gives our lives meaning. But those connections are broken, in America especially, since shortly after we are born. We give mothers no time off to be with their kids virtually, especially compared to other countries. From the time that we are six weeks old, we are having complete strangers look after us, and the bonds that are supposed to be formed between mother and child are being broken. 
And fathers get no time off. I mean, like, just forget about dad actually forming a real connection with that baby, unless he's wealthy and able to just take off work whenever he feels like it. We have no federally guaranteed maternal or paternal leave, and this has devastating consequences for the psyches of our children and thus adults later in life. And why are we breaking these bonds with our children so early in life? What is so important that we have to pull away from the one life that we created so we can go off and spend the majority of our time working these meaningless, often unnecessary jobs that only exist to create profit for the oligarchs sitting at the top of the pyramid. And we need these jobs just to survive because basic human rights and necessities in this country are not met. Not even water is considered a basic human right in this country. Water on a planet that is 70% water. Well, Tori, I just don't think you understand freedom. That is not freedom. We will, however, guarantee resources to capitalists who want to turn around and then sell these vital resources needed for survival back to us at a profit. Again, American life has no meaning. We live in an extremely polarized society that is fueled by the hatred of the other. We are engineered to fear anything that is different or unknown. And the fear of change is a mental prison that almost guarantees a miserable life. Nevertheless, that is where most people believe that they comfortably exist. America is the most racist, sexist, bigoted nation on the planet, and if you do not realize this, then you just do not get out very much. The inequality that we all experience on some level in the United States makes us hate each other because we all have difficult lives despite working as hard as we possibly can to obtain some form of success that the American dream is supposed to offer. All of our self-destructiveness ties back to our lack of meaning. Our suicide rates were some of the worst in the world before this crash happened. Now they are catastrophic. The United States is a death cult. We worship death and violence and the weapons that facilitate the death and violence. We have annihilation fantasies about going out in a blaze of glory. The epidemic of mass shootings is just further evidence of this. Some people are so demoralized and depressed that they just cannot see a future in which they are happy. They just can't wait to die and are all too willing to take down everyone else around them. The media always points to mental health problems as for why these mass shooting events happen, but the media will never explore the deeper causes to these mental health problems. They never want to dig deep to understand what the driving force is behind these behaviors. Spoiler alert, it's capitalism. Nihilism is a natural reaction to a society such as ours. Citizens have developed fantasies about stopping bad guys with their guns. This leads racists to use patriotism to justify murdering unarmed black and brown people in the name of protecting their own, when in reality they are acting on the fear of the other that they have been so thoroughly indoctrinated with. In a capitalist society such as ours, we worship property ownership over human life. We consider protesting to be storming the capital with assault rifles, brandishing swastikas and American flag t-shirts as a means to intimidate lawmakers to allow people to get back to their shitty third world quality jobs. Living under these conditions, is it any wonder that all of us are trying to destroy ourselves. It seems to me that the reason we worship death the way we do in this country is because death would be a sweet release from the pain and suffering that we are forced to live with in this dystopian hellscape. All of the problems that we have discussed in this video will only continue to be passed down the generations and grow worse and worse if we do not recognize the driving forces behind them. As hard as it is, we must work to heal the damage that was instilled in us by the generations before. We must understand where our self-destructive tendencies come from, 
Otherwise, we are doomed to repeat this cycle until we destroy ourselves. Nothing will ever get better in our society if we do not accept the responsibility of repairing what is broken in our own lives. Our only way out of this is to remember how to be human. Life is too short to hold on to resentment. Being consumed by fear and hatred is like drinking poison in order to kill someone else. We don't have all or any of the answers to these problems. We don't know what revolution should look like in America. All we know is that humans need to learn how to love again, for the first time maybe. We have all heard the saying that in order to change the world, we must first change ourselves. Our hope with this video is that this message will become more than just a cliche. The very survival of our species depends on this. There is a saying that the night is darkest just before the dawn. But we certainly hope the sun comes up soon because it's so dark right now that it's getting very hard to even see a future.